Shalom, Shalom. Shalom, Shalom. All right, man. Let's see here. I'm going to go ahead and get started. See a few people joining. Uh, Shalom, Brother Don All here with another uh, 30 for 30 video. I think this is day four, man. Number The number four is very mighty. Uh, we know the fourth tribe is the tribe of Judah, man. And uh, we know that Judah was set over his his brethren, you know what I'm saying? We also know that our Lord came out of, he sprang out of Judah, right? And so today's topic is going to be um, what it means to take the Lord's name in vain, right? I'm going to go ahead and pop it off with the book of Exodus chapter 20 and verse number seven, right? And it reads, thou shalt not take the Lord, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain, right? So when we look at this scripture initially, right, and we see that we shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain, what does this mean, right? What does it actually mean? A lot of, I know uh, growing up, we would hear, we would hear things like saying uh, the phrase uh, GD, right? If you don't know what GD is, you know what I'm saying? It's uh, God and then it's damn, right? And so... Really, when you look at that word and to dissecting that word, it just means uh, God condemned, right? Now, by no means am I am I advocating you saying that saying that phrase at all, anyway. Just because the nature of our society, you know, what I'm saying it's it's not tasteful. You know what I'm saying? You got to move with wisdom, and it might be offensive to some people, right? But that's not exactly what taking the Lord's name in vain really means, right? A lot of people might say if you say. Uh, you know, if we, we was growing up, people would uh, get get startled or shocked or uh, emotionally distraught. And they'd be like, oh, my God. Or, oh, my God. Right. And the first thing somebody would tell you, hey, bro, chill out, bro. Don't say the God. Don't say the Lord's name in vain, man. You know what I'm saying? You'd be like, hey, man. You know what I'm saying? And it's kind of always played tricks on us and our, on our minds. Like, dang, man. We Now we got to substitute it. Oh, my gosh. Or. People, people started to slide away with saying, oh, my God, instead of saying, oh, my God. You know what I'm saying? But what really is taking the Lord's name in vain? You know what I'm saying? We got to figure this thing out, right? Because first of all, God's name isn't even God, right? We know that God is just a title. And the word God is placed on a whole bunch of things, right? He calls us gods, right? The so-called, the uh, not the so-called, but the Israelites, right? He calls us gods. He also calls Satan the God of this world, right? So even if you want to go by that logic, you still wouldn't be taking uh, the, the, the Lord's name in vain because God is just a title. Right. We know as Israelites, we have one God. Right. Uh, proceeding to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter uh, six and verse four. Right. But God is just a title. Nonetheless, um, in Israel, you might hear that his name is called um, Yahweh. Right. You can go to the book of Exodus. chapter. Uh, I want to say the. The sixth chapter, right? And he'll tell you that in the in the uh, canonized Bible, it'll say Jehovah. But when you go into the, the Hebrew, you can break it down as being Yahweh, right? Or some people in Israel uh, refer to his name being Ahia, right? Where you can go to the Exodus, I think the third chapter where he says, um, and you break that down in the Hebrew, it's I am that I am, right? So we know that God is not even his actual name. God is just a title, right? And so what exactly is taking his name in vain, right? And taking his name in vain in lamest terms, it would be simply just um, taking his name or, or let's see, it would be taking his name selfishly, taking his name upon you selfishly, right? Or for vanity, right? For vain purposes, excuse me. And so what does this kind of look like? Well, in, in society, you can see that people, you know, uh, will, will say, you know, they'll say stuff like, I'm a Christian, you know what I'm saying? Or they'll even say they're an Israelite. And they'll say this kind of just to be like politi politically correct in a sense of if I tell them I'm a Christian or if I tell them I'm an Israelite, I'm going to look like a good person. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to look like I'm holy. 
You know what I'm saying? They're just saying it to be politically correct, but they're not really doing, they're not really taking his name upon them, right? And carrying it with some type of substance, right? They're really just taking it for vain reasons to make them look a certain way, to make them uh, appeal like they're a mighty man, to make them appeal like they're a righteous person, right? Let's get an account on that. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 6. The book of Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 7. And it reads, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking, right? So even in the Christian church, right, you might go to um, church on Sunday and uh, what will happen is, right, whether it's the sermon or a prayer, right, it always seems to be about three hours long of somebody just giving their straight opinion, right, and using all these big words, right, all of these um, King James type words that you might not even really know for real, right, they're, they're using... These there's they're, they're even even when they pronounce the word God, you know, what I'm saying in these Christian churches, it, it amazes me how they can sound so profound when they say it. You know what I'm saying? You know, they'll be up there and they'll be like, and God, you know what I'm saying? They everybody knows. Everybody knows that the preachers got that one that one tone. I really can't even get it myself. Right. But when they say God, you know, what I'm saying it's all in the tone of how they say it and whatnot. And it's almost like it's a requirement to be a teacher. I mean, a preacher, you know what I'm saying nowadays. But so when they do these things, right, it's only so they can be looked at like they are, uh, you can say over, uh, or you can say righteous, but in like, and so they only using these words and these big terms and these long prayers to make it seem like they got the spirit or that God's dealing with them. You know what I'm saying? And that's not always necessarily the case. You know what I'm saying? That would be a, a um, instance of taking his name in vain, right? When we take upon him uh, his characteristics, right? Or when we take upon his name, right? And we only do it for, van for vanity, for vain reasons, for selfish reasons, right? Um, let's get another one. Um, Flip with me to the book of Habakkuk, right? Let's go to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2 and verse 12, right? And I'm going to let y'all get there, right? But so another example would be straight up America, right? Because we all know that in America, the slogan for America is what? In God we trust. You know what I'm saying? And do does America really trust in God? First of all, don't even don't let me even get started on the shot. You know what I'm saying? You're not trusting in God at all when you're trusting in that shot, right? And so, when you look at America, they're saying something, but they embody something else, right? They're saying in God we trust, right? But we all know that this country was built off of the. Uh, rape, rob, and murder of our of our so-called ancestors, the so-called Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Indians. You know what I'm saying? How can you trust? How can you be founded on God, right? One nation under God, but it was built off of the blood of our ancestors, right? This is what, in layman's terms, what you can call it is hypocrisy. You know what I'm saying? Let's get that in Habakkuk two and twelve, right? Because this is America. This is the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, and verse number 12. And it reads, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood and established a city by iniquity, right? So that's what America did. They built this town on blood, right? We see monuments all around America today, even the White House, right? Who built that? We did. You know what I'm saying? We built all these big, these plantation homes and whatnot and couldn't sleep in it, right? We were building houses that we couldn't dwell in. Proceeding to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, one of the curses, you know what I'm saying? That was us. So so how can the, the Bible also tells you, hey, well, to the man that stealeth the man and sell us, sells him. How can you be saying one nation under God, right? You're taking upon him his name. You're taking his name upon you, right? But you're not being 
in any type of way obedient to what his word actually says or what he actually embodies. This is what we call hypocrisy and taking God's name in vain at its finest, right? See, one nation under their God, right? Because it's not the God of this Bible, right? I don't know why. I don't know why they swear in. They make you swear in on this Bible for everything, right? But they go against. They go against it a hundred percent, right? So take take for instance, somebody somebody might be going to court for a hate crime, right? Say say you said something to a homosexual, right? They make you swear in on this Bible, right? But then they they give you a uh, prison time. Or they'll give you some big behind fine to pay, you know what I'm saying? Because you because you said something against this homosexual man, right? But the same Bible I'm swearing on tells me that man should be put to death. So why am I getting condemned for it? You know what I'm saying? It's all backwards. This is what you call taking the Lord's name in vain, right? When you take upon him your, his name, right? And instead of making him good, you're making him out to be a liar. You're making him out to contradict his word. You know what I'm saying? And this is this is what this is what the embodiment of taking his name in vain. It's not saying, oh God damn. It's not saying, oh my gosh, oh my God. You know what I'm saying? It's none of these things. It's clearly just making him look bad, making him out to be a liar, right? When you're in a Christian church and you're and you're a pastor, you're taking his name on you, right? And when you take his name on you, you can't be out here preaching that um homosexuality is okay. That's taking his name in vain, right? The brother said Hebrews 6 and 6. Let's go there real quick. The book of Hebrews chapter 6 and verse number 6. And it reads, If they shall fall, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, Seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame, right? See, they put him to an open shame because every time you sin, every time you take his name upon you and you go off, right? You put him to an open shame. You crucify him again, right? He already died for your sins once, but now that you keep going off, you keep taking his name upon you and you keep going contrary to what he says. You crucify him every single time. That's a good precept, mighty precept brought out by the brother, right? Um, since we're in Hebrews, it's only fit that we go to Hebrews uh, 10 and verse number 26, right? Let's get that. The book. This is the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we, we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, right? And so... The sacrifice that our Lord, right, who sprang out of Judah, you know what I'm saying, mighty through the spirit, who came and died for our sins so we didn't have to, so we could be dead to sin. And what does that mean? Being dead from sin. Being dead from sin, that means we abstain from sin. Being dead from sin doesn't mean, hey, look, I'm dead to sin. That means no sin I, I can, no, there's no sin I can do that is going to hold me back from the kingdom. That's not what it means. Being dead to sin is to excuse evil, right? Being dead to sin is saying, hey, look. How can I be how can I be um, dead to sin without being in bondage to the law, without being in bondage to um, the commandments? Right. So being dead to sin means you don't do it no more. You know what I'm saying? For if we sin willfully after that, we have received the knowledge of the truth. Right. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. So if you if you sin willfully, if you take his name upon you. Right. And you sin willfully. Right. You make him out to be a liar. You contradict. Uh, his word, you make him look bad, which is taking his name in vain, is making him look bad, right? When you make him look bad, that sacrifice that he did for you is null and void. It don't count no more, right? And me and me as a person, you know what I'm saying? I know he's gracious enough to, to, to bring you back into that fold, right? But he can do what he want to do. He's no respecter of persons. You might only have that one chance, right? It might, it might just take that one chance for you to fall off to make him look bad, to make him look like a liar, right? To take his name upon you and uh, to take his name in vain, right? And he has no mercy towards you at all, right? And then we go back to the book of Exodus chapter 20 and 7, and we know that your punishment will be at hand, right? This is why we got to repent daily, right? Uh, let's get that, right? I think it's in uh, second, let's go to second Chronicles, right? Second Chronicles 
chapter 7 and verse 10. We got to repent daily. And I'm going to show you how we're supposed to repent. Right? Second Chronicles chapter 10 and verse number 26. Right? Uh, man, bear with me. Second Chronicles 7. It's like it. 7 and 10. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse number 10. And it reads, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, right? Not to be repented of. What does this mean, right? When we repent, we got to repent with a godly sorrow. That work is salvation, not to be repented of again, right? So once we repent, right, we got to repent with a godly sorrow. This means a sincere, a sincere, a sincere repentance, right? What, what does this look like? So when you repent with a, a godly sorrow and you really mean it, you're not going to do it again. You know what I'm saying? You're going to come out swinging harder than, you know what I'm saying, before you fell off, Right? That way you won't have to repent of that sin no more. Because what does it say? For godly sorrow work is repentant to salvation, not to be repented of. So you're not going to have to repent from that no more. Because once you acknowledge that, you know what I'm saying, it's wrong, you turn from it and you don't do it again. It's simple as that. It's really simple, man. You, you know, this, this Bible, this book and this faith is like an algorithm, you know. And everybody knows, if you don't know what an algorithm is, in school an algorithm would be, uh, the Pythagorean theorem, I'm thinking A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's a simple stuff, right? You acknowledge your sin. After you acknowledge your sin, you don't do it no more, right? This is what a godly sorrow of repentance looks like, right? Read it on. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world, this would be taking the Lord's name in vain. Because when you have sorrow of the world, right? And you repent with a sorrow of the world, you're not really repenting for real. Right. You saying you repenting, but you're not really doing like everybody. Everybody has that one prayer. Like I'm going to be I'm going to be quite frank with you. You know what I'm saying? Especially for my people that are um, of age. Right. We all now I don't even want to. Uh, we all have done some things that we weren't proud of. And before we went to bed, you know, what I'm saying we on our knees talking to the most high like hey, the most, hey, look, God, I promise you if if if. If you don't let this, I know I did this, but, and I know the consequence is this, but if you don't let this consequence happen, I promise I won't ever do it again. All right? We all done had that prayer before. And what do we do? You know what I'm saying? We might be cool for about a week or two, but then we going back to doing the same thing that we told God we wasn't going to do no more. What does the Bible say about um, somebody that takes a vow, right? I believe that's in Deuteronomy. Uh, I believe that's in Deuteronomy, right? Where it talks, about, I think it's in chapter 23. Where it's talking about if you take a vow to the Most High, you better take, hey, you better, you better pay him what is due, right? And that's just not taking a Nazarite vow, right? That's not just taking a vow before your wife. That's taking a vow coming into this truth, coming into this faith, and becoming a new creature. That is a vow in itself. And when you take that vow, it's nothing to be played with. When you're saying, hey, look, I'm ready to be dead to sin. I'm ready to be in bondage to Christ. You know what I'm saying? The brother put it on there, Deuteronomy 23 and 21, right? And so when you're ready to be, when you make that vow to become a new creature, it's over with. You know what I'm saying? You don't do the things you're supposed to do no more. And if you do, you're a hypocrite and you take the Lord's uh, name in vain. It's that simple, right? So you want to repent with a godly sorrow, which worketh repentance to salvation, right? Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world, right? which is taking his name in vain, right? It works death. You see that? So when you repent with a with an earthly sorrow, saying, I'm sorry, and then going back to, to do it, you know what I'm saying? I promise I won't, if, if Lord, and I wasn't going to say it, but hey, look, it's the spirit. Lord, I promise you, if, she, if, if please don't let her be pregnant. Please don't let her be pregnant. And if, and if, and if you just hold out on this baby, this one time, I promise I won't ever have sex until I'm married. You know what I'm saying? We all done said something like that in the world. And what do we do? Fall right back in the trap and have sex with somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Or have sex with the same girl. You know what I'm saying? 
after he don't looked out, right? He could have he could have hit you with he could have hit you with a baby and rocked your whole world. You a freshman in college. You know what I'm saying? He could have hit you with a baby. You don't rock your whole world. Now you got to get a job, go to class, right? Worried about all this baby stuff. Your baby mom, your baby mom's kind of, you know what I'm saying? She getting attitudes. She getting sick. You got to go take care of her. You know what I'm saying? You might be on the basketball team. Now you got to balance all of this. Or you might even even end up being like, hey, look, I got to I got to I got to do what I got to do and step off out, outside of the basketball class. You know what I'm saying? The ways of a man are foolish. Like the brother said, you know what I'm saying? No, I ain't sneak dissing, bro. No, I ain't. Hey, bro, you did it in righteousness. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I ain't sneak dissing. No, no. If anything, I'm sneak dissing to myself. You know what I'm saying? Because I've been in that position, right? And um, I've been in that position. I done been a hypocrite. I done hit my knees, right? That's why I'm coming out swinging. And we're going to get there, too. Let's go to the book of uh, James chapter 2 and verse number 22. Right. The book of James, chapter two. And verse 22, and it reads, Seeth thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. Right. By your. So look, this is how it is. Right. Everybody. So we all know, you know, what I'm saying it takes more than just calling yourself a believer. You know what I'm saying? It takes more than just saying, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm an Israelite. It takes more than that. Even the demons, even the demons believe, right? You know what I'm saying? But what does it take for you not to be a hip called a hypocrite or take his name in vain, right? See it thou how faith wrought with works, right? You can say you have faith in Christ, but how do you prove it, right? What makes your faith perfect? And by works was faith made perfect. So by the works is your faith made perfect. And what righteous works are these talking about? Proceed, going back to the book of Judges, chapter 5 and verse 11, you know what I'm saying, where it says to rehearse the righteous acts and then you'll be delivered. You know what I'm saying? While we're in this captivity, we ought to rehearse the righteous acts. What are the rehearse, the righteous acts? You go to Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. It tells you that the, um, the duty of man is to fear God and keep these commandments. You know what I'm saying? Those are, that, are the righteous acts. The book of Revelation, chapter 12 and um, verse 14, I believe. It says, here are, the, here are the patience of the saints, the ones that feared God, right? That kept the faith and kept the commandments, right? This is how you don't become a hypocrite by keeping the laws of God. It's that simple. It's that algorithm that you cannot mess up. You know what I'm saying? Um, let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. Because we're going to see how a lot of people are going to be, you know what I'm saying, in the, in the end times. And we're living in end times today. There's so much things popping off, man, between that shot, between all these wars and rumors of war. It's not even it's not even rumors of wars no more. People tanks getting blown up. You know what I'm saying? Ships getting blown up. Missiles getting shot off, man. We at the end. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter seven and twenty two. Right. And it reads Matthew, chapter seven and verse number 22. Many will say to me in that day. Right. This day is the day of the Lord. Right. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You know what I'm saying? What is this saying? Many, many people take on his name and do many things in his name, but do it for the wrong reason. Many people seek out to use his name to heal people just to say, hey, look, and they'll, they'll, they'll do it just for, so people can say, oh, that's a mighty brother. He got a mighty spirit of, of healing on him. That's a mighty brother. He has a mighty spirit of prophesying on him. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, were you doing it with a godly, with a godly, a, a, a godly sorrow or an earthly sorrow? Right. Were you doing these things because you was in bondage to Christ or were you doing these things for vain, vain reasons? Right. For vanity, for selfish reasons like the, the vain babblers uh, do in, in Matthew chapter six. What are your intentions? And I can tell you right now. Other people might not understand what your intentions are, you know, other people might really think you're this genuine healer, 
this genuine this genuine prayer, right? This genuine uh um prophesier. They might really think you're genuine, but you can't. There's one person that you can't fool, and that's the day of the Lord, right? I'm gonna read it again. Matthew chapter uh seven and verse number twenty two. Many will say to me in that day, the day of the Lord, 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 have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name hath cast out devils. They're taken on his name. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Why are you working iniquity? Because you're making yourself to be out to be something that you're not. Right. You're pretending to be filled with the Holy Spirit and you ain't got it. You know what I'm saying? It's quite that simple. It's an algorithm. Remember what I said? A, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Right. It's as simple as acknowledging your sin, not doing it and being sold out. You know what I'm saying? It's plain. It's just like this. Right. Because at the end of the day, we all have things that are required of us. You know what I'm saying? Especially Israel. If we're going to be the light to the world. Right. We got to walk in these commandments. Let's get that. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10 and verse number 12. This is a um, this is a great scripture to go to for anybody that's in, new into this truth or just got the um, just got the revelation that they were an Israelite. This is a go to. Right. This is a book of chapter uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 10 and verse number 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord, thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart and with all thy soul to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes. For I commanded thee this day for thy good. Right. So this is what's required of us. So when we come into this faith and we embark on that new journey of 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 trying to be a new creature, we got to understand what's required of us. Right. To keep the commandments and these statutes, right? We got to come back to our heritage. You know what I'm saying? And that, and when we do that, we don't make ourselves out to be a liar. We don't make ourselves out to lead anybody astray. Because how you live your life can determine whether somebody's going to come to this Bible or not. How you live your life is going to determine on whether or not people think God is a contradiction, right? Because we're his face value right now. He made us in his image. You know what I'm saying? Deuteronomy 7 and 6, right? He made us a holy people unto himself above all people that's up, up, upon the face of the earth, right? Because we're supposed to be the example. So when we embody that example, we got to act accordingly. Because if not, then the whole world going to go astray. If we're saying we God's people, right? And we going around doing a hell of wickedness, they're going to think God promotes wickedness. This is taking his name in vain, making him look bad. And I know anybody, right? If I if I'm a if I'm a big spender, right? If I if I'm if I got a lot of money, right? Everybody know Jay Z owns like um, a percentage of the Nets or something like that. Something like that. If you if you got a lot of money and you invested in something, right? You putting your name on it, right? If I if I am uh, if I am the GM, the general manager of the Lakers. I'm putting my name on the Lakers, right? If they don't if they don't perform well, it looks bad on me. And what do I got to do? I got to start making cuts. Somebody got to be off the team. We need to bring somebody in that's going to do this thing the right way. And the most I got operates the same way. You know what I'm saying? He operates the same exact way. And so when we look at that, we got to be like, dang, man, I don't want to get cut. I like playing for the Lakers. I'm in Los Angeles. I'm living it up. I got my dream car. He's providing. He's providing for me. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to get cut. You know, so we got to do what's required of us every single day. Right. That's why in conclusion. Right. I'm going to go to the book of Baruch. Chapter four and verse number twenty eight. Right. Because believe it or not, we all have have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Right. We all have taken his name in vain, especially when we were back in the Christian world, just living a Christian life in the club on Saturday, in the pews on Sunday. You know what I'm saying? Taking his name in vain every single time. Right. All them vain prayers. Lord, please let me make it to the NBA. You know what I'm saying? Knowing good and well, I wasn't going to do nothing righteous with it. You know what I'm saying? 
Lord, please don't let her be pregnant. Please don't let her be pregnant, man. I don't need this in my life right now, right? He touched her womb, you know what I'm saying? And she, and she wasn't pregnant. What'd you do? You entered, it, you entered into her again, right? You shot the club up again, right? Vain, taking his name in vain, right? Abusing the power thereof. Right. That's why in Baruch chapter four and twenty eight, we all got to we all got to come back in this thing. You know what I'm saying? The right way. Right. Let's go to the book of Baruch chapter four and verse twenty eight. And it reads for as it was your mind to go astray from God. Right. When we were in the world, when we were doing the things of the world, it was in our mind to do wickedness. Right. We went astray reading on. So being returned. So when you come back, when you renew your mind. Right. When you become a new creature, the Bible says the law is perfect, converting the soul. When we come back to these law, statutes, and commandments, right, start representing him the right way, right? What happens? After sinning and coming back, reading on, seek him 10 times more. We got to seek him 10 times more. And when we seek him 10 times more, this is repenting with a godly sorrow, right? I tell people all the time, right, repenting with a godly sorrow looks like a man Right. That went into prison. And while he was in prison, it breaks him down to the point where it's like, dang, I got to get my life back on track. And now that my life's back on track, when I get out. Right. I got to come even harder. I might come out and I make a, a, a YMCA um, children's program so I can teach people not to do what I did. You know what I'm saying? I'm coming 10 times harder. And that's what we got to do in this faith, because when we come into this faith, we got to understand we get in bondage to Christ. Right. We're slaves to Christ. You're dead to sin. You don't do the same things you do. You used to do no more. Your life is over with. You know what I'm saying? In a good way. Your life is over with. You live for the most high and him only unto death. Right. His disciples. Right. They were appointed to preach this word unto death. Right. And we got to take on that same task. That's especially in these last days. Right. Because we've been the wickedest. We've been the wickedest out of all of our forefathers. We got to come. 10 times harder. You know what I'm saying? So taking the Lord's name in vain is simple. It's not, it's not saying GD, right? It's not saying, oh my God, right? It's making him look bad. Taking his name upon you for selfish reasons, for vanity, right? And to not do that, we as so-called Blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, especially, we got to come back to these law, statutes, commandments and do them. You know what I'm saying? That algorithm for the day right, is acknowledge your sin and don't do it no more, right, so we don't make him look bad, right, because when we, when we take his name upon, upon us, when we take his name upon us, and we do contrary to what he tells us to do, right, we take his name in vain, that's what it is, that is taking his name in vain, so we got to come back to these lost as commandments, seek him 10 times harder, and with that, you know what I'm saying, I say shalom, peace, peace and blessings, and a, uh, uh, a hearty shalom to all the brothers out there pushing this truth, right? Y'all have a good night. Salaki, bro. I don't know how to, um, do I just hit the X? I'm back. I'm, I'm new to social media, bro. I just hit the X. Somebody talk to me, man. I guess so. I wanted, I wanted to save, though. Bruh, do I hit the X? Okay, it's gonna save. Uh, it's gonna save. Okay, con, con, con. Shalom.